Eric, can you hear me okay? Excellent, excellent. Okay, that makes things easy. I don't have to ask that for 20 minutes. Okay, so are there any questions before we uh, move on? Sorry about next last week. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I was having some interesting behavior uh, working on the uh, homework for this due, I guess, in like a week. Okay. Um, the class, uh, the provided one for providing the random shapes mm -hmm. wasn't random. Well, that's I'm interesting. I'm not entirely sure how Kotlin is seeding it, but every uh -huh. single time I opened it, it was the sa it, it produced the exact same. Ah, uh, so, so yeah, I'll ha I'll have to check into how to do that with that. Um, there's a, there's a way you can set up the seed on it, but I'm I'm not sure offhand. Yeah, I switched it to the Java uh, the Java a uh, random, and it it, <laughs> it now gives me different ones. Let me see here. I'm gonna take a quick peek at to get a seated instance of the random generator, use the random function. Um, so it looks like there's just one, the, the single instance is the same one. Um, we want to use random paren paren. Um, let me take a look at that sample. Uh, uh da -da 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 assignments and gem matcher. So come down here. Yeah, so uh, what I should do is create an instance of that guy. Let me just edit this real quick. These online editors are a joy. <laughs> so we should do something like private val random equals random. And then down here, just change that to a lowercase. And that should take care of it if I'm reading the docs correctly there. OK, thank you. So give that a shot and let me know if that seems OK. And thanks for pointing that out. No problem. Uh, Okay, any other questions before we move on? No. Okay, so let me close that and that, and hopefully that will work. Okay, so um, today we're gonna talk about uh, communicating between an Android client and a server. Yay, fun stuff like that. Um, we're gonna be using REST to communicate back and forth to them. Uh, and I should grab my slides here. So I can find those real quick and development modules, rest, and do that. OK, so um, we're going to talk a little bit about what rest is and how you can communicate with it. There's a whole bunch of different APIs to do this. Uh, we're going to be using Retrofit, which is one of the more popular ones. Uh, I'm not sure if that's considered the best practice at this point, but at the point I wrote this, it was. So we will see. Um, it's easy enough to use, which is nice. Um, so REST stands for representational state transfer. And the whole idea behind REST is that you have data sitting somewhere on the web that's represented as a, by a resource URI. So each piece of data has a unique uh, 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 resource URI associated with it. And you interact with them just using the standard HTTP methods. So you'll either use an HTTP get, post, put, or delete. And each of those has a different effect on um, what you're trying to do with your data. One of the key things that you want to do here, actually, let me just move to the next slide here. And yeah, that's what we're going to talk about. I'll come back to that in a second here. Um, when you're communicating uh, with these URIs, they could be at an HTTP server. They could be somewhere else with some other type of uh, scheme associated with it. Typically, it's going to be HTTP, though. When you reference a path, so there's going to be like a type here. Let's say the type is movies. If you're just talking about movies, you're talking about the collection of movies. Generally, that'll return all the movies that exist. 
you can add some filtering to it, but that's unofficial. And you could do that with some uh, query parameters you add on using question mark and then some other, inf other information being passed up there. If you specify an ID after that resource type, it's just talking about a single resource on the web. Each of the REST methods you use to communicate with it will have a different effect. And this corresponds to our CRUD operations. So Git will read the information from wherever it's going. Post will create it. Put will update. And with a put, you have to actually pass a body that contains the update that you want. And delete will delete it. For uh, the read and delete, you just have the ID being passed. For post and put, you have to have a body to say what you want to create or what you want to update. You can return the result as JSON, XML, whatever. Right now, the, the most common result seems to be JSON that people are using for that. JSON is a pretty simple format, but if you prefer XML, XML has got some benefits as far as cross linkages and a little bit more metadata associated with it. Um, and you can actually represent a graph in XML as opposed to JSON, which has to be a strict tree. Speaking of JSON, JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. And it's actually JavaScript code that if you ran it in a JavaScript emulator would create some data for you. Uh, this describes an object and it's a strict tree. You can't have any type of cycles. You can't have references to other objects unless you use some unofficial uh, support for adding in some linkages into the tree. Uh, this is defined at json.org and it's really, really super simple. Here's an example of an object in JSON. Objects are represented by having curly braces and then name value pairs. So we have like the name and then Jenny, phone, phone number, email, and email address. Nice simple object. Now over here where we have these strings, you could also have other objects or other lists. So you can nest these arbitrarily. Now a list, has a square bracket around it, and then comma separated lists of other things. So they could be comma separated list of objects, they could be comma separated list of strings, numbers, other lists, however you wanna nest these guys. Uh, and let's see, anything else I wanna mention on that one? Oh, one thing just to be really careful about this, if you say name without quotes on the side over here, if you were getting that interpreted in a JavaScript environment, it would actually see if there's a variable called name first and then actually evaluate it and then use that as the, va as the value there. Uh, I don't know if there's any JSON interpreters out there or JSON uh, parsers out there that do that, but just to be safe, put them in quotes. Because um, what JSON will do as a rollback is a fallback is if it can't find a variable named name, it would actually use the string name name. I hate JavaScript, the passion. That's why we're using Kotlin. Kotlin is so cool. Um, and I want to teach a Kotlin multi-platform class so we can actually do uh, use Kotlin for web applications and not have to worry about JavaScript. And it'll do all the JavaScript mess behind the scenes. Um, now, what your REST server is going to do it doesn't really matter behind the scenes. It can be any piece of code that follows those HTTP calls. HTTP calls. You could do it in C, C++, PHP, Python, whatever. As long as you are respecting that HTTP interface, it doesn't matter how you code it behind the scenes. Uh, we're gonna be using Jersey, which is a little bit old. I think there's some newer uh, versions of it or newer approaches that are uh, uh, more well-liked. Um, eventually I'm gonna switch over to KTOR, which is a, a, a way to create a little server in Kotlin. Uh, it's, that's K-T-O-R, uh, but I haven't actually worked on that yet. So we're just gonna stick with Jersey. We're going to create a little simple server here. It doesn't really matter for the exercise here because we're focusing on the Android side. We just need something that works. So here's an example of what a Jersey implementation of a REST server might look like. Uh, we create a controller class, define a general path for it. So this is saying that anytime I'm entering my web application, this controller takes over. And then for individual methods, you're adding path extensions on that. So if I went to the movie uh, the, the movie subdirectory on my server, I would end up calling this get movies function. Inside here, you'll see I'm just keeping track of a map of movies. And actually that should be outside the REST controller because it's actually gonna create a, a new REST controller instance each time this thing is called. Uh, so you really don't wanna have any data that's supposed to persist. So if we move that outside, as we'll see in the example that we're gonna do a little bit later, 
it'll actually stay as a, a single instance of the list, even though new, new controller instances are created. Now in our Git movies down here, I'm telling it, first of all, what kind of HTTP method is gonna be called here. So I have the Git specified there, giving it the path. And then I'm telling it what types of uh, output can come out of this guy. You could have multiple types in here. And here I'm just saying it's only JSON, but if you had multiple types, then the caller could actually request a certain type saying, hey, I want you to tell me in JSON, or I want you to respond to me in XML. So uh, this just you know will take care of converting whatever is created here into JSON, into XML, into some other format. When we're creating this movies method, one of the things that is a really good idea is uses response. You can directly return the entities list, but then if there's a problem, it throws an exception. And that can, that can make things kind of messy when you're making web calls. Instead, if you use this response builder, he will create a response object that can internally have data telling you was it successful? What was the HTTP code? What was the HTTP mes message? What was the body of the result coming back? And if an exception were thrown on the server, it could encapsulate that in a form that you could actually use and fetch out of the JSON. So this particular response here, I'm gonna say, let's set the status to okay. So I'm just gonna assume everything is fine. And then set the body to be the uh, list of all the values. So in this case, I'm saying, take the movies, Grab, the, grab all the values from this map, which will be all my possible movies, and I'm gonna sort them by title. So that way I can build this response, wrap it in that little object, and then on the Android client, I'll have a nice response object that can tell me, did it go okay or not? On the, uh, the Android side, again, you can use any HTTP library to do this. You can do this completely by hand using OKHttp, okay for example, and make HTTP requests, and then parse the responses yourself. It's much, much simpler to go ahead and use some kind of a library that uh, can do the, the REST parsing for you and understands what REST means. So in our example here, we're gonna use Retrofit 2. And Retrofit 2 allows you to just define an interface with some functions to call. And it will take care of all the plumbing for you. It'll take care of creating the JSON to send it off to the server, send the proper HTTP request, get the response, and then return the response to you. So we'll see in this case here, I've defined a get all movies, get movie, and an update movie function. Each of these functions is going to go off to the server. So I say get movie, movie is going to be the path used sent to the server. Movie with an ID is going to be passed to the server. And in this case, you'll see that the ID has curly braces. That's going to be replaced by this path parameter that's passed into get movie here. So if I make this call to get movie, passing in 42 as the ID, the path to the server is going to be movie slash 42. And then that'll give me a response wrapping around a movie instance. And then we can do the same kind of thing down here for updating a movie. I'm doing a put function here to that same URI. So I can either get that movie or I can update it. And uh, the put is going to be doing a update on that as opposed to a post, which does a create. <clears throat> so this update will take a body object here, notes body in annotation, and this body is going to be used as the body of the put converted into JSON. It's going to return us response, and in this case, it's a response that just has an integer telling us how many items were actually updated on the server. Finally, down here at the bottom, I'm creating a nice little create function on that interface. I'll talk about companion object in a second here. And all this function is gonna do is use retrofit to set things up. So he's going to create an instance of some class that he's generating that implements movie API service, and then has all these functions associated. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if behind the scenes this uses something called dynamic proxies in Java, so that on the fly it can do things rather than having to gem generate code. Uh, if you're interested, dynamic proxies are really super cool in Java. It lets you define an interface and then have a dynamic implementation where you can just say, well, what was the function call? What were the parameters? Let me figure out what to do with those. And you don't have to actually write any code. You just have this handler that you write that deals with it. It's, it's pretty neat stuff. Um, so in here, I'm also adding a converter factory here. And you can have multiple converter factories that know how to convert to different formats. Because uh, on this particular one, I cut out the... Uh, uh, 
the how do I uh, translate it to JSON or whatever. In this case here, um, depending on what's on the server, if I look up back up here, if we have the produces, it's going to send us a JSON. We need to convert that into objects. And that's what one of those converter factories are going to do. Uh, if we added a consumes, that specifies which formats the server can accept. And then the client can use that information to be able to uh, specify uh, which converters are going to be used. So in this case, I'm saying I'm going to use the JSON converter factory. And this is the Google JSON parser. He will be able to convert between the JSON that's coming back and these objects, assuming that the objects have uh, uh, some standard way of setting themselves up. Uh, basically, simple data classes work fine. Otherwise, you can throw some extra annotations in them to help specify, oh, if I see field X, put it in this property. Um, if the property name happens to be the same as what's coming, JSON will take care of that automatically. Now, the base URL is saying what server I want to talk to. So that when we create this instance of this guy, we'll take that base URL and then concatenate these gits to it to make actually our URIs that we're uh, corresponding with. Um, so we're going to build all that guy there and then create an instance of the movie API service. So this just sets things up for retrofit and then actually creates the instance of the service that we're going to talk to. Now, quick mention about companion objects. If you're familiar with statics in Java, so static functions, static variables, things like that, um, there's essentially in Java, anytime you say something static, there's a single instance of that that any class can look at. So if I had a, a movie class and maybe I had a static variable that kept track of how many movies exist, any movie class instance can actually look at that number and see it and say, okay, there's 42 movies out there. Uh, if it's a variable, they could actually update it as well. Um, if there's functions, the functions don't work against any type of instance data. So for each specific movie, if it has a name and a, a year and an actor list, the static functions wouldn't be able to see that data. They can only see static data as defined. Um, that always caused a little bit of confusion with people, but in Kotlin, they tried to set it up so that it's a little bit more obvious what's going on. So what a companion object is, is we're creating an, a singleton object instance here, and it's unnamed. It's just a singleton object that is attached to the movie API service, and he has a function in it. So there's, this can have function, it can have properties, whatever. This is just a singleton object that any instance of something that implements movie API service can see. Because it's public, I could say movie API service dot create to actually run this function. And that's what they end up doing when, uh, when we're actually creating this, uh, the, this retrofit builder. Now you don't have to do it this way. We could actually put this code just in line wherever we want to create this instance, but it's kind of nice to put it in the same place here so that it's really attached to the definition you're working with for uh, a retrofit. Okay, so that's the, the concepts we're going to deal with. We're actually going to make modifications to this so we can actually read off a server and update a server. Now, the first thing I'd like to do, though, do a little bit of cleanup. Um, we were starting to go down this path where I was going to keep track of rating IDs and things like that. Um, and uh, <clears throat> there's a few little problems with the way that I had this thing set up. Uh, if we go deeply nested into our application and you start backing out, we're not going to see type C updates. We're also uh, not going to see different movies as we go back through. So if we go from one movie to another, to, a, to an actor and then back, we could, we'll see the same movie the way back. At least I'm pretty sure that's what this is doing. Let's take a run on this real quick. This is actually a different application running. So this is the status of our movies three example here. And I'm going to go ahead and reset my database. Let's go into transporter two, see Jason Statham, see Hobbs and Shaw. And then when I go back, we'll notice that Hobbs and Shaw is here instead of transporter two. So, and I started off by clicking transporter two, Jason Statham, Hobbs and Shaw. And when I go back, boom. And the problem there is that I'm only keeping track of a single rating or a single movie or a single actor at a time. Uh, and 
that's not good <laughs> for the type of application we wrote here. It's really not going to work out. Now, there's really two types of navigability you can kind of think of in an application. You can think of a very fixed graph where if you had like an email application, you can have a very fixed graph of the different screens that you can see. You can see a screen which is a list of all your emails. You could see a screen that displays an email. You could see a screen that edits an email. You know, maybe that's all you have in your application. And you really don't have this deep nesting like we're seeing in this particular application. It's just a very flat, very fixed graph. In a case like that, this could work. You could have, you know, keep track of which email you're editing, which email you're viewing, that type of thing. Um, and then a list of all the emails. With this application, that just doesn't work too well because we actually have multiple instances of our movie screen inside of our, what just happened there? Is it trying to view my, it looks like it's trying to view my video. I'm gonna stop my video on there. That was silly. Um, so, oops, I lost my participants list. There we go. Uh, so um, let's see, where was I? Uh, in this particular case, we can have multiple instances of the movie viewer and each of those is gonna have to have its own instance of the objects. That causes some issues. If I actually keep passing in the real object to each of these screens, I now have a fixed immutable instance of an object. And if I go deeper and deeper and edit some things and come back out, I won't see that object changing. And so that's a problem there. So what I'd really like to do is change things up here a little bit. I wanna set it up so that each of my screens if it represents a single movie or rating or actor, each of those has an ID variable inside of it. So that when I pass that into my uh, composable function, I can use that to look up the data. And we'll see how we do that in a minute. But first, let's go ahead and change our data a little bit here to do that. So let me delete what I was starting here because that's not gonna be good. And Things like rating screen, movie screen, and actor screen, these are the lists. So I don't need an ID in those ones. But when I get down to rating screen, movie screen, movie edit screen, and actor screen, each of these needs a specific ID to know what to display on that page. So I'm gonna change these into data classes so they can hold a piece of data. And I'm gonna say val ID string as a constructor parameter. And so this is going to make this be a property that's gonna be accessible. And you have to specify it when you create this instance of the rating screen. So that'll be good there too. So that has enough data to be able to keep track of where we are. I'm gonna get rid of these guys now because they just don't make any sense anymore. I'm gonna get rid of the little selection guys here, which were switching which one was visible. and up here when I did an update, I'm not going to select the movie. And what this did before is when we did an update, this would actually change the selection so you'd see the data change, but you still have that one true movie that's being displayed across all movie screens. So I'm gonna delete him as well there. And let's see how that goes. I'm gonna update this. And one other little thing I wanna talk about here is while well, I saw this update on the screen here, this is a suspend function that's gonna be run in the background. And right now, this is being called from a coroutine that's created inside of, what is this, the movie edit screen, I think? Well, actually, just that, it's, his update is being set up inside there. So uh, inside this UE function, this composable function, I'm creating a coroutine and updating. Um, doing an update this way is a little bit dangerous. You know, I was talking with somebody else at work and uh, we're trying to come up with some, some good direction to give people in general. And one of the things that we're really leaning here is when you're doing updates, we don't wanna do them in a coroutine scope that's defined inside the composable functions. And the reason for that is that the composable functions set up this scope. And if the user is no longer seeing that particular screen, that scope will cancel the update that's happening. So if we went out of this screen, let's say the user went out of the screen super fast, Maybe they're super, super fast, or maybe the data update is really slow. Um, when they come out of that, 
the coroutine is going to try to cancel uh, the coroutine scope defined inside the uh, composable is going to try to cancel it. Um, so doing it here isn't a great idea. What we really want to do is in our view model, tweak this to not be a suspend function. He's going to be a normal function that we can call, but have him kick off a coroutine to do the update. So I'm going to say view model scope dot launch and then put my repository update call inside there. My repository updates call is going to switch over to the IO dispatcher to do the actual work. This launch actually happens on the user interface thread. Uh, so if we wanted to, we could switch this explicitly here and say dispatchers.io so that this guy wouldn't have to do the switch, but we're already doing the switch in, on the update side. So we don't need to specify this one here. Okay, so that will actually set it up so that uh, we'll create this uh, uh, coroutine under the view model scope. And that'll live as long as the view model is available. And the view model will be available until you exit your activity. Um, so again, if the user is super fast getting out, we might have an issue with this. And this is a, a bigger issue that we're trying to look at on, you know, what are suggested ways of making sure that these data updates happen. Uh, you know, part of what you want to try to do is make sure the user can't exit the application until the data updates are done. But if it gets kicked into the background, Android can kill this process anytime it wants to. So there's most of the time, everything's perfectly fine here, but there's some concerns as far as, you know, we really want to try to get this right. So uh, look for some guidance on that in the future. So back to my main activity. Now what I can do is remove this scope.launch. And what I'm actually going to do just to make sure I can get all these guys, I'm going to kill the scope that was created. Whereas, oh, he's passed in. So I'm just going to go ahead and kill that. And then I can start undoing some of these. So let's take a look at this block down here for, for a moment. This is from the rating screen. And this is how we were actually switching over to the movies. So when the user clicks on a movie uh, for that rating, it'll go to the movie screen for that guy. And what we were doing before is we were calling select it which was a function that would go and look up that movie and set it so that when the movie screen is shown, we'll see it. Well, because we're actually going to pass the ID into that movie screen, we don't need to do this selected anymore. And now this push becomes a super simple thing that doesn't need to fetch any data. So I can actually remove the coroutine, the, the coroutine from that guy. Uh, and inside here, now movie screen, you'll notice that it has an error because I'm not passing in the ID of the thing that I want to actually uh, uh, set up in there. So let's uh, make a little tweak inside here. I'm going to go to the rating screen. And we'll see inside here that we have this select, which is whenever you click on something. And we pass that movie DTO out. Because we're only dealing with IDs now, I'm going to change that just to be a string to say that I want to go see the movie with this ID. And that'll be held inside the, uh, the stack. When this movie that's being displayed is clicked, I'm going to pass in it.id instead of just it. So I'm going to grab the ID of that selected movie and then pass it back. And so now if I come back out here, this guy now gets the ID passed in as a string. And I can just go ahead and pass that in to my movie screen. So now I'm pushing onto the stack a movie screen for a specific movie. That's a much nicer way to do things there. Um, I also inside here, let's see what the movie scaffold was doing with the scope here. So for each of these actions that were defined, he's actually passing that in on a scope. Um, yeah, I don't think we really want to do that. I think we just want to call this. If we make the action be Let's take a look at what actions are being passed in. I think it's just going to be edit and the reset database. 
So for the reset database, that's going to be one that the view model has to end up creating a, a coroutine for. So we don't need that. Yeah, we're not going to need this. I'm going to go ahead and kill that from here. Boom, 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 like that. And then down here on delete selections, again, we're going to make that so that it's a function that the view model is going to be creating the uh, coroutine for. And he's set up as a suspend function, so I don't want him to be a suspend function anymore. And that should clean him up. OK, so that's the movie scaffold. That's cool. So we'll get rid of the scope that's there and get rid of the scope that's there. And let's take a look at what else this rating screen is going to need to do. We need, we're getting, we need to get an ID passed in to tell us which rating to display. Because um, right now we're actually passing in this rating with movies objects, and we don't want to do that anymore. We want to just pass in an ID so that the screen can look it up for us, rather than us looking it up in advance and then passing it in. So I'm going to change this guy to have an ID, which is going to be a string. I'm going to assume it's non-null, because you're only going to be opening up a rating for something that you actually have an ID for. And then what I want to do is be able to look up this rating with movies. One thing you do not want to do, well, let's come over to the view model and set, set up this lookup first. So I'm going to say suspend fun um, get movie with uh, actors, or with roles is what I called it, right? Yeah. And we're going to pass in the ID there. And we're going to make that be a call to repository dot. Oh, I need to modify him. So instead of saying expand here, I'm just going to change this to say get rating with movies. And change that to an ID string. And the same thing here. And here, something like that. And then let's fix our movie database repository. And we'll make that be an ID. ID and ID. And then these, we'll just get rid of the rating dot movie dot actor dot. So that should set up our data so we can actually get these things by ID a little bit more cleanly. What is he not happy with here? Oh, I said DTO on the caller guy. Let's get that out of there. That should fix that up. Good. OK. So I'm going to say repository, get movie with roles, passing in the ID. Boom. That's a nice little pass through. And we can do the same kind of thing, get actor with roles, and get Rating with movies, something like that. So now back in here, in our rating screen, we need to look this up. And we really don't want to pass in the view model to do that lookup. We want to abstract that so we can actually uh, use this in a test, You know, pass in a dummy instance of this creator. So I'm going to put a uh, fetch movie which is going to take a string and return a movie with roles DTO. And that is going to be a suspend function because we want that to run in the background. Well, actually, let's first of all, let's not make it a suspend function. Let's just talk about what would happen if I tried doing this normally. If I came in here and said val movie, let's do this guy. 
Oh, that shouldn't be fetch movie, it should be fetch rating because we're inside this rating function. If I try to do something kind of like this, it kind of looks like this should be okay. There's a couple problems with this. One, this will be run every single time this function is recomposed. And if this function has some animation in it, that could be 60 times a second or you know, however many frames per second we end up uh, recomposing things on the screen. So we really don't wanna look things up that quickly. The only time we really wanna look it up is if that ID changes. And what we'd really like to do is offload that. We wanna make sure that our user interface is snappy and we can display the user interface right away without waiting for this fetch to have happened first. Looking at it right now, I'm gonna to have to wait for that fetch to return and then render my user interface. So that's kind of gross. So what we really wanna do is we really wanna kick off a little job on the side to do this fetch, get the data, and then display it. To do that, we're gonna use something called a launched effect. And we're going to put a key on this ID. And what this means, I don't really don't have to have the key there, but what this says is I'm going to cancel and restart this launched effect anytime the ID changes. Launched effect kicks off a coroutine for us. And in this particular case, using a coroutine that's scoped by this rating screen is a good idea because if the rating screen is no longer visible, we don't need this data. We can go ahead and cancel that fetch. So doing this at this point is actually a good move. However, where are we putting this data? We need to make sure that when that data has been fetched, it's accessible to the rest of this function. If we just put it in a val out here, that's not gonna be any good because then the rest of the function doesn't know when it changes. So we need to use a mutable state and we're gonna put that mutable state inside the tree that represents our user interface. Putting something inside the tree that represents the user interface is using that remember function. So remember creates a little, little holder inside of our UE tree. We can put anything we want inside there so that we can calculate it once and stick it in there, or we could put a mutable state inside that little hole in, in the tree. And that gives us a little bucket that we can update. And because mutable states are part of the snapshot system in Compose, the rest of this function will know when it changes and be able to refresh just the parts that need to be refreshed. So to do that, I'm going to come up here and say var ratings with movies by remember mutable state of, uh, whoops. Oh, uh, where's the type? There's the type there. Bloop. And initialize it to be null. And what this is going to do for us is the remember creates a holder inside that tree that represents our user interface. That holder is containing another holder. In this case, this mutable state. The mutable state is basically a bucket that we can update. And so down here, I can just say ratings with movies equals fetch rating, and it will run this inside this coroutine. Once it's the fetch is done, it will stick it inside this bucket. And it goes inside the bucket because we're using this delegation, the by. The by delegation says anytime somebody communicates with rating with movies, delegate it to whatever's defined over here. The remember will delegate that to whatever's inside of here. So setting this ends up putting data inside this bucket. Now, there's a couple little issues here. You'll see that we have uh, errors. If I float over this, it's going to say that it doesn't have this get value function. This get value function that's asking about is an extension function on top of get mutable on top of mutable state that allows you to do the delegation. This delegation is implemented by a get value and, and set value function. To do that, I can just hit alt enter on that squiggly line and say import get value and mutable state of. And then I'm gonna to have to do it a second time for the set value. And boom, now that's all nice and clean. So that 
when I come in here, it's going to launch this, fetch the rating, put it in this bucket. If I come in with a different ID before this guy is done, this launched effect will be canceled because the ID was being used as a key. And then it'll kick off a new one. Any other time that we come back in here to recompose, if the ID hasn't changed, this will not get relaunched. So this is known as a side effect inside Jetpack Compose. And I really wish that they'd chosen a different name for it because one of the things you don't wanna do with Compose is have side effects. Uh, and side effect generally means you're modifying data outside of the function or doing some, you know, hitting something directly outside of the function that um, your model doesn't know is happening. So um, unfortunately they called these side effects. Um, I would have preferred to maybe call it, uh, I don't know, a, yeah, I really don't know what to call it. <laughs> maybe a, a co-launcher. So uh, it's, it's something that as soon as you come in here, you run it at the same time, but um, it, it, the messaging gets a little confused when you tell people don't use side effects, then you say, except for these side effects. So uh, it would have been easier to keep it separate. Um, but that's really what this guy is doing. We get an ID being passed in. We kick off a job to go and get it. If the ID changes before we're done, cancel that job and kick off a new one. Once it's got the value, it puts it in this bucket. And then that bucket gets used anywhere else inside this function. So now I can get rid of the rating with movies there. Woo. So now I'm getting the ID and the fetch rating get passed in there. Now inside of here, let's see, is there anything I wanted to do to, so you have description, it might be null there. Um, let's take a look at the title up here. So the title, if we don't currently have a rating with movies, it'd be nice to change the title to the word loading. So what I'm gonna do, is come down into app source main res values strings and we'll add in a little loading message. And whenever you use ellipses like this, it's going to come back at you and say, hey, you should be using the special uh, Unicode ellipses character for this. So that's what I'm going to do here is change that by saying uh, alt enter, or actually just, whoops. There we go. And then that changes it to that Unicode character. OK, so now I can actually put that inside here. Instead of using rating as the default, I'm just going to use loading as the default. And I think the rest of this is probably going to be OK. We have a movies rated blah. So this, this block in here, I think what I want to do is make this conditional on if the movies exist or not. Otherwise, it's going to say movies rated, movies rated blank, which isn't really going to make a lot of sense. So let's go ahead and say ratings with movies. Let. And we will do a ratings with movies. Put this guy up here. And now inside here, all these are non-blank, non-null. And there we go. So that way it won't display that second section if the thing is blank, if the, if the, uh, the thing coming in is null. That fixes up our rating screen there. And I want to do something. Uh, well, let's fix it up inside the, the main activity now. So we no longer need the scope. Uh, we're going to need to have ID equals. Well, one thing we got to see, you notice here how rating screen is OK, but then these guys are not OK. That's because rating screen is an instance. It's that singleton object. These guys are actually just classes now. So instead of actually having actor screen there, I have to say is actor screen, saying if it is of that type. Is is essentially the same as instance of in Java, except so much easier to type. So we'll fix those. 
And now down in here, I can say current screen dot ID. Because of smart casting inside this block, Kotlin knows that current screen is rating screen. So I can just go ahead and say, get the ID off of that. And then I can say fetch rating equals view model, get ratings with movies, just like that. And is it because it's suspend? Yes, yeah, so this one here is a suspend function. And inside here, I didn't make it a suspend function. Um, and he can be a suspend function because he's being launched inside a coroutine. Now he's happy there. And then I get rid of that. And we're set with that. So now our rating screen should be OK. Let's do some similar stuff with these other screens. Um, let's go to the, well, let's clean up these other guys first. So much to do. So on each of these screens, I can get rid of these scopes. He's not needed anymore. Did list scaffold have a scope? Yeah, you can get rid of that because he doesn't need him. And on delete selections, found a suspend function. Um, oh, so he's no longer suspend. And then in my actors screen, he's no longer suspend as well. And now I can clean up the rest of this. So the last part down here was I no longer have that scope. Reset database is going to have to kick off its own coroutines. So let's go do that. He's not going to be suspend function. He's just going to be view model scope dot launch. Put the database reset inside there. So now he's scoped by the view model. If the user exits that screen, it's not going to be a problem. Okay, so we'll just get rid of that. There he is. And in here, delete selected actors is a suspend function. So each of these ones, I want to do the same kind of thing. I want to use the view model scope to kick them off and make them not suspend functions. There we go, that cleans them up. And now he's happy. And on the actor screen, when I'm switching to, uh, when I'm picking an actor from the actors list, I now just change this to say, well, let's clean him up in there as well. So he's gonna have select is gonna take a string and to the list scaffold are, uh, on toggle select, on item click, I think is the one that that is. Isn't it? Yeah, on item click. So let's change on item click in there to be a string, which will just be the ID. And we'll just pass in the key there. Okay, and he's okay now. And so now we're gonna pass in the ID there, boom, we'll switch over to that screen. And let's do some cleanup in here as well. And down here. And this guy is getting that movie DTO, so let's fix him up. Make that be a string. And then down here, well, on delete selections is not a suspend function anymore. Get rid of the scope. And now I think we're all good there. Oh, and no scope passed in. Okay, and then out to here, we can just pass in it. And then similar at the rating screen. On 
Delete is no longer suspend. Select takes a string. Get rid of the scope there. And that looks good. Oh, we don't need the scope up there anymore. And now we can pass in that string. And then the actor screen, get rid of the scope, get rid of those guys. Um, whoops, where is my actor screen function? There he is. No, I wanted actor screen, there he is. So no scope, select is gonna take a string. And then this one here is gonna be select it.id. And that's really close. So now we gotta change this guy to take in an ID. So we're gonna fix that up, but let's get him cleaned up first. And movie screen, we'll do the same kind of thing. Get rid of the scope, change the select to be a string. And I'm gonna change the on edit to also be a string with the ID. And then this one, it.id as well. And he's better there. Boom, 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 boom. And this one is going to pass in that guy as well. And then the movie edit screen, get rid of the scope. On uh, movie change, gonna get rid of the suspend on him. Get rid of the scope. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. And that's better. Okay. Boom. Boom, boom, boom. And then the rating screen looks good. So we're almost there. And if we're lucky, this is actually gonna work. Um, what am I missing inside here? Oh, don't need the scope. And we can get rid of that scope there. Okay, so now back to down here, let's finish these guys up. So our actor screen, instead of taking that actor, he's gonna need an ID, just like we did with the rating screen. So I'm just gonna copy those two guys, go to my actor screen, and say fetch actor, and we'll say actor with roles DTO, and then we also want to do similar to these, And this needs to become ba doom, ba doom, boom, ba doom, and then I can get rid of that guy. Okay, so now my actor screen has the ID in the fetch actor. He looks the actor up the same way as before, and we're going to do the same thing with this movie starring stuff here. I'm gonna say actor with roles, let, so that we only do this if it's not null. I'm gonna just move all this up inside here. Clean up the null ability. I always like it when things aren't null. If it's ever possible, that's a good thing. Okay, so that's our actor screen and in our main activity, now we need to pass that in. So ID equals current screen dot ID and fetch actor equals view model, get actor with roles. And then we can delete that and boom, our actor screen is done. Two more, so our movie screen 
So let's go back to rating and we'll copy the same kind of thing. And then we'll come back to rating and do these IDs. Fetch movie and we'll say movie with roles. And And then we need a little cleanup down in here. So we should really only, the description field we can still display, uh, but I'm gonna wanna make sure that if it's null when it first starts out, we just display a blank. This whole section down here with the cast of, we're gonna do the same kind of thing. Movie with roles, let, And then we can just move this guy up in here. And that all, what is unhappy up here? Oh, um, so this, when that button is, so this is actually one thing here, this button at the top to edit the movie, we really only wanna have that button if we actually have a movie loaded. I could say just ignore it when it's clicked, but it'd actually be a little nicer to have that button just not show up. So what we'll do here, uh, so let's see, for the title, we wanna do the loading as we did before. R.string.loading. And then here I'm gonna say if, or we can just say uh, movie with roles, let, And otherwise, empty immutable list. And what is unhappy there? Oh, I've got a paren, this thing there. There, that's better. And I probably missed one of these loadings in some of the other screens. I'm just gonna leave those for now. I just wanna to get to a working state so that we can move on with the, the topic for today. Uh, and then back here, ID equals current screen dot ID and fetch movie equals view model, get movie with roles. And now the movie screen is done. Now the movie edit screen, so a slight bit more complex, but not too bad. Let's go back to our, I might as well go to the movie screen for it. So we need to look up the same data. So in the movie edit screen, we'll look up that same data there. Let's get the ID and the fetch movie. And let's take a look at what's unhappy down here. So now these are nullable. Um, for the fields on the screen, I want the fields to still appear, but just not have any data. So uh, the values are coming from title and description, which come from movie with roles. Uh, in these, what we really wanna do is anytime movie with roles changes, we wanna make sure that this remember is kicked off so we reinitialize these guys. Otherwise, if we don't do that, we'll end up with blanks on the screen. Um, and let me actually just demonstrate that. Because what ends up happening with remember is it's called once and the value is remembered. That's why it's called remember. Uh, and so when it's called once, we get this mutable state set up with the title inside of there. Um, and actually, oh, and I'm using mutable state so I can actually set it. Um, so unless the user types, there won't be any change there. Um, when the data is loaded, well, when the data first starts out, it's null. We come down here, these are both gonna be blank. And then once the movie with roles is loaded, 
these won't get kicked off again. In the interest of time, I'm just going to go ahead and do this here. So we want to say whenever the movie with roles changes, reinitialize the title and description. which is also important if you change movies. You go to edit a different movie on the screen. Um, for our application, that's not gonna happen, but if we have side-by-side -side user interfaces and the user could click on things in the list and see the changes in the detail pane, that's really important uh, because we wouldn't be re recomposing the entire page. Um, these values would just stay, which would not be good. Okay, so then down in here, for these text fields, there's a couple ways we could go about this. We could say, if the movie with roles is null, just uh, don't have the actual text field. Well, you still want the, I, I wouldn't want it to, to kind of blink on the screen and get annoying. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, let's just ignore the change completely if movie with roles is null. So what this will do is if the user starts trying to type, they're not going to see anything until the movie's been loaded. And so this is going to be like that. OK. And we'll do the same thing down here. And that should protect that. OK. And we'll come back over to here. Is that everything I needed on him? I think so. And we'll say ID equals current screen dot ID, get movie. I can just copy that from up here. Fetch movie is what I wanted. Get rid of that guy. And there, now he's all clean there. I think that's it. Let's go ahead and try running it and see what happens. Now, if this works, we should see um, going through that same path I had before should preserve the right movies. So I'm going to go to Transporter 2, go to Jason Statham, go to Hobbs and Shaw. And now let's go back. So we're at Hobbs and Shaw, Jason, uh, Jason Statham, Transporter 2. Boom. It worked just fine. So that took care of uh, that problem. And I think the code's a little bit simpler. And there was a lot of work to get to there, but we kind of undid some of the, the extra stuff that was in the, the other version. Uh, let's see, what was I just thinking? Oh, I want to get rid of this, clean that up so we don't have this stuff. This was just to show the screen scrolling. Uh, and so that's going to be on the actor display page. Actor screen. And we'll just come down here and kill that little for loop that was putting extras on the screen. And so now we should actually see something that looks nice and clean. Transporter 2, Jason Statham, much better. The transporter will come back. Good. So that all looks good. OK, any questions on that? I know that was a little bit of the lightning round there. But hopefully that made sense because there was enough repetition that you had to see the same changes being made several times. Um, I, this is so much better than things were, boy, how long ago did I start working? 30 years ago? Uh, and you just had straight text editors. And you know this is nice because it actually highlights errors, makes it a lot easier to see what you need to, to update. Oh, and actually, yeah, when I first started, they didn't have syntax highlighting. Oh, it makes me feel so old. I actually started writing a syntax highlighting editor. Um, and uh, then some others came out and I'm like, hey, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, OK, so that guy's in good shape there. I'm going to do a little commit to a local repo here just to uh, keep track of this in case something goes wrong. I can back out some changes. So uh, let's see, switch to. IDs in the screens. So that was a good good fix there. Now let's start talking about how we can do this whole REST server thing. 
I need to wait for that to be done and commit it. Android Studio, when you're committing to the to to Git, does a little pre-submit that actually runs the linter against it. Uh, and you see there were four warnings that I had. Um, I didn't want to bother with those. It's probably going to be you know some really trivial things in Android. Um, but four warnings is pretty good there. Generally, I like to have it be clean. I just don't want to use time on it. So in our application right now, we have an app, a data, and a repo module. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw a new module in here called REST Server just to have a little server we can start up locally. Normally, I wouldn't put it inside of an Android project, but it's just convenient to keep it together so we don't lose track of it. So I'm going to come up here and say new module, and it's going to be a Java or Kotlin library. I'm going to call it a REST server. And do all that stuff. Let's come into here. I'm going to get rid of that little dummy class they create. And I want to tweak my build slightly here. Uh, instead of having it be Java library, I'm going to have it be an application. So I can actually run the application. And let's just copy over the rest of the stuff I wanted in here. OK, so I just switched this so that the compatibility layer, layer here is using Java 1.8 syntax. Um, then down in here, I've added in a bunch of dependencies for Jersey. So this is actually going to take care of my server for me. And finally, my main class is going to be called Run Server KT. So I'm going to pull over the code for this stuff and drop it in here. And let's take a look at a few things in here. I need to sync it just to make sure things work OK. <clears throat> and let's see what we got here. What I did to start with is I, I created some entities that are going to be used on the server side to represent data. And I'm annotating these so that Jersey can end up doing the translation for me. So on the server side, Jersey's taking care of the JSON creation and parsing. On the client side, Retrofit is using a, the adapter library for JSON to do that. <coughs> Pardon me. So I basically pulled over the same types of classes. On the Jersey side, things are a little bit more explicit. You got to specify the property name. Um, there may be some way to configure it so that you don't have to do that, but I haven't seen it. And then these are XML things that can be returned. So I can return an actor directly, and then it does the stuff underneath. I can return an actor with roles. I did the same thing for movie and for rating and for role. Now, role, I don't think I need to do that anymore because I don't think I'm ever returning role in this version of it. Last year's version, I was actually returning the role, then had the client doing a little bit more smarts. Basically, I, was, I had the, the REST request super, super simple. You could get each of the individual types directly. And then the client had to make extra calls to figure out, once I have the actor, let me go ahead and get all the movies that star that, star that actor. Um, I've changed it a little bit so it's a little more consistent with the, the structure that we used so that uh, I can actually return these the, the extra data. Um, and I don't think I'm using expanded appearance anymore either or expanded role. These are old ones. So I'm going to delete those. And where is role being used? So I'm still creating instances of it and keeping track of it internally. And I do have an update, but I don't think I'm ever calling that. Now let's take a look at the controller on here. And this is the controller that's set up using Jersey. And it's pretty simple stuff to set up. I'm going to talk about the stuff at the top in a minute. The REST controller has all these functions that you define, which tell it what it's listening to. So if the user passes in something rating for a git, I'm going to return all of the ratings. If they do it for movie, I'm going to return all the movies and so on. If they ask to get a rating with an ID, this is where I'm actually going to return that complex object, the rating with movies. So I'm actually going to build it up here and return it. The data that I'm using, I put out here just as some privates at the top level. So these will just be single instances of these variables that can be used by this REST controller no matter how many instances of the REST controller are created. I could have put these inside of a companion object as well. That would have worked just as fine, because then there'd just be a single instance of it. 
Um, I've just kind of grown fonder of having the common data at the top level rather than having that extra companion object level in there. Um, I'm not quite sure what the, the Kotlin community opinion on that is yet. Uh, if people have moved more toward this, I just, for some reason, I just don't like having that extra object containing these. Um, having them private here makes them so they're only accessible inside this file. So I'm setting up some maps here, and there's a little extra data in here to keep track of which role they were in. We didn't take advantage of that, or we didn't do anything in our data model to handle that. Um, but this one actually is keeping track of saying, here's the name of the character. Uh, we're not returning that at any point here. At some point, we could change the, the data model to do that. So I'm keeping track of all the movies by their ID, the actors by ID, ratings by ID. And then for a given movie, for that movie ID, he has a map of who was starring in the movie, similar for by the, by the uh, roles. Um, I'm not using that. I can go and delete that. If an actor is not found, I'm just going to return a dummy ID in the word not found. Um, here's some helper functions that I'm using to actually create the response objects. So you remember in the example I showed in the slides, I said, you know, use these response builders to build things. So in this case, a general response is passing in the status code. So was it okay or not, that type of thing. And then the entity that I want to return. And then this just builds it. Then I just have some more direct helper functions here that use that. So a response okay entity, not found entity, or created entity, that type of thing. In my REST controller in here, to get everything, I'm going to say the response is okay with the values from the ratings, that's all the ratings sorted by name. If there's an exception thrown here, it'll turn that into the appropriate code coming out of there. So if it's um, well, I'm not doing anything explicit for not found here, but uh, if there was a, uh, uh, an exception, it'll end up returning some 500 type code. These guys are a little more complex. They get rating with movies, get movie with roles, those types of things. Um, what I'm doing there is I'm saying, I want to take the, I want to look up the rating first based on the ID and then pass that into this rating with movies. And then I want to look up all the movies that match it. So this is not super efficient. You know, if I was doing this as a real application, I'd want to do a little bit more indexing on it. But basically, I'm just going to walk through all of the values of the movies and just keep the ones that have the rating ID that I am. Similar for these other two, with the, getting the actor for roles, movie for roles, and so on. For updating them, I'm just going to take the movie and stick it in my map. Nice and simple. And I'm going to say, Hey, I, I updated one thing. And then down here, update role. I'm not directly calling. Uh, anything else down in here that was interesting? Uh, these are just some helpers to be able to set things inside nested maps. And I can't remember where I'm using these. Oh, so we'll see down in here when I was creating a role, I was actually doing kind of a two-dimensional reference into that array, and that function takes care of that two-dimensional reference, but I'm not using him. And um, then there's functions to delete and all that type of stuff there. Okay, my uh, reset function. Uh, let's see. Wait a second. Oh, I'm sorry. So these are some helper nested functions. For some reason, I was thinking I was just looping through and then repeating things. So my reset database clears everything, defines some helper functions, which just end up setting things up. And then I call these insert functions to actually insert the same data that we saw before. Uh, the run server, this was just an example off the web. So I ended up uh, copying his license in there. Um, in this guy here, this main, is just saying how I start up a, a nice little Grizzly server. And it's a real simple little server there, registering how to deal with REST controllers and mapping the JSON. And so fairly uh, short little thing to run the server. So when I run this guy, this should, did I just, I just did something wrong there. There we go. Um, I must've dragged something. 
Uh, so when we run that, that should start the server. So let's go ahead and try that. I'm gonna go to my terminal here and I'm gonna say Gradle W run. And that'll run whichever module has the uh, Java application defined. And what is he unhappy about now? Oh, I'm already running it somewhere else. Let me go over here, yeah. Okay, let's try that again. So this should build it and then uh, start up our little server. So the server is running right now. If I went to a browser, do I have a browser open? No, I do not. And I did localhost. colon 8080, whoops, I want a colon, slash movie. That's gonna give me a list of all the movies. And right now there's no movie defined. If I come up here and think that I set, they call it reset. Yeah. And now do movie. I'm gonna see a list of the JSON of all the movies from the server. So this just kind of shows us that our server is working here. Um, I could go and uh, use a tool like Advanced REST Client to do some more demonstrations of communicating with it. We're going to do that from the application anyway, so I'm not worried about it. Um, so if we wanted to get a specific movie, I could just add the specific movie ID and boom. And you'll notice here that this is returning that nested data with the roles, uh, which is really nice because now the, the client only needs to make that one call saying, give me movie M3, and he gets all the movie that he, all the data he needs for the one shot. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so let's take a look at the client side of this. Actually, yeah, I'm gonna do one more commit here, add rest server and commit that. And so now we need to actually start putting the support in there to talk to this server. Now there's two places we have dealing with the data, the data level and the repo level. The data level right now is the thing that talks to room. So it's actually our data source that we're dealing with. The repo is just a nice little layer on top of that to make things immutable coming out. So you can't see that data source. Um, I've defined these as two modules. Typically we call both of these together, the data layer. And a lot of times people just put the repo in with the actual room stuff. I really like separating them out just so that we can say that repo depends on data. So repo can see the entities. App depends on repo. So the app cannot see the entities from a room, which is nice. You can't accidentally use the entities directly. You have to use the DTOs. So what I'm going to do is at the data layer here, we could create another module just to do the, uh, uh, the, the REST communication. I'm just going to go ahead and use the same data one, and I'm going to reuse the entity code there. The entities that we have inside of here, like actor, these are just normal data classes. So from the retrofit point of view, it just ignores these annotations. He doesn't care about them. He just cares about the classes themselves. And it's got all the data he needs to fit and use JSON to fill them in. So I can reuse them. Alternatively, I could have created a different module just for the, the uh, REST server data that I'm retrieving on the client side, uh, but I'd have to repeat all these classes. So to do this, let me grab, first of all, a movie API service. And this is a little service that I've defined using retrofit. So because of that, I need to actually update the build file. So the build file under data, I'm going to add in the retrofit libraries here. So the first one I have here is the main retrofit base. The second one is support in order to be able to convert the results from and to uh, JSON using the JSON library. So I'm going to sync this. I'm going to hope this sync works. When I tried this earlier, 
I ended up having to uh, clear the cache in Android Studio. For some reason, it wasn't seeing the converter. Um, is that going to work now? Yeah, this guy, it wasn't able to find. If you end up with some weird behavior inside of Android Studio, which Android Studio is a little buggy here and there, um, so is IntelliJ. Eclipse was perfect, by the way. Um, what you can do if, if you end up having something that you're like, I, I definitely have that, it's available. You can go to File, Invalidate Caches, and then hit Invalidate and Restart. Um, if you want to, you can clear the file system cache and local history as well. Local history is actually kind of a nice feature that they copied from Eclipse, uh, where if you don't have something set up inside Git, you can still take a look at the changes you've made over time, and it'll save a certain number of changes. Uh, I'm going to hit Cancel here. Um, but for local history, if you wanted to, you could right click on something and say local history, show history, and it's going to show you a bunch of changes you've made to things. Uh, and this is super, super helpful if you're in between commits on Git. Uh, you can take a look at the individual changes that you've made. Uh, and you know some of them are going to be pulling files in, some of them are going to be making changes to files, but really, really super nice. Okay, so now we've got our retrofit stuff here. And this is very similar to what I demonstrated. This URL here is kind of an interesting URL. When you're running an emulator, the emulator is running on, on your machine. So it's running on your laptop, running on your desktop, whatever. If you're running the emulator on the same machine as a server and you want to get to something else running on that machine, 10.0.2.2 is the host machine for your emulator. Now, if I said, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, the uh, local host there, that ends up referring to the emulator itself. But by saying 10.0.2.2, you're escaping yourself and going to the machine that's hosting you. So this is how I can run an emulator and get to that server that's running. If I go back to the terminal here, we'll see that that REST server is running on localhost 8080. So that's on my laptop. So I'm going to use that as my base URL. And you probably would want to have the user be able to set that via settings to say where they want to go to. Or you might have use some kind of DNS to look it up. So inside of here, get movies, get actors, get ratings, or just returning these lists of movies, actors, and ratings with a response object. Uh, similar down here. These guys here are just, just get doing the get ratings with movies, get movie with roles and so on. And they're gonna return the responses with the ratings, movies and so on from the server. So each of these, if I end up calling this function, that is going to send a request off to the server, HTTP 10.0.2.2.8080 slash movie. Boom. This one will be HTTP 10.0.2.2 colon 8080 slash rating slash whatever ID. So those requests will be made for you and the appropriate date, data will be returned. And all that's being handled by retrofit. We don't have to set up any of the, the networking calls there. And so that's all good. Um, we're not using the creates right now. Deletes, reset database, that all looks really good. So we've got our movie API service set up. <coughs> and... Now we need to take a look at the repo layer because the repo layer is what's really going to be deciding which thing to use here. So inside the repo layer, we have a movie database repository. I want to add in a movie rest repository. So I'm going to copy him and paste him over here. And I may want to simplify a few things in here. Now, this guy, he needs a few classes out of retrofit, so I'm going to have to copy those. Uh, I'll resync that. <coughs> And good, he looks good now. So let me explain what's going on inside this guy. This repository is gonna implement that same movie repository interface. 
And that means that I'm going to need to have ratings flow, movies flow, actors flow, um, get actor with roles, get movie with roles, and so on. All those same functions that we were doing with the database, we're now going to sip across the web to do some things. In order to deal with these flows, retrofit isn't giving me any type of flow information. The server isn't giving me any type of flow. So I'm going to need to actually manage this manually. Anytime I change data, I'm going to explicitly make a call to reload the data from the server and push it into a flow. So for each one of these, I need to create a flow myself and put data into it. I'm using a little helper class up here to manage this for each one of those. And really all he's doing is first of all, holding on to a mutable state flow. And a state flow is one where there's a single value at any given time that people can take a look at. And I'm starting him off as an empty list. And you'll notice that I have him defined using an underscore here. This is my private version of the, the flow that's mutable. I'm gonna use it internally. And then I have the public version of the flow here that is just gonna expose it as a normal flow, so as an immutable flow. So this means that anybody on the outside can't see the mutable stuff. They can't change it, they can't emit to it. Um, and then I'm defining a nice little fetch function here. And what this fetch function is gonna do is he's going to run in the dispatcher's IO and then call whatever fetcher was passed in. So when I create this list flow manager, I'm passing in a little fetcher function here and he's a suspend function. This guy is going to kick off a coroutine on that scope. We're going to run the fetcher. If the result is successful, I'm going to return. So let me, let me see if I can say this right here. Fetcher is going to return response object. Take if says, let's take a look at the response object. And if this is true, return the response object. Otherwise, return null. That's what take if does. So if this is true, return the object and keep going. Otherwise, make it null. So this example here, I'm going to say, if it's successful, return the body of that. So I'm actually going to get the, the value. Otherwise, an empty list. Now, I may want to do something different here and say, if there's an error, display the data. But for right now, I'm going to say, if there's an error, just display nothing. Not a great approach. The last thing inside here is I have an initializer block, which is run when this guy's created, which does an initial fetch. So we're just gonna look the data up immediately. So I'm gonna create three instances of these guys, ratings flow manager, movies flow manager, and actors flow manager. And the fetch functions they're using are going to that API and calling get ratings, get movies, and get actors. Notice here, I'm using that create function from the, uh, the companion object to create the instance of the movie service. And then I'm using it to talk to the rest service on the web for those three. <coughs> Pardon me. These are the managers I'm using internally so I can emit to them. The flows that I expose, I'm gonna go to the ratings flow manager, look at that public flow there, but then I'm gonna do the same kind of mapping that I did before. I'm gonna convert things into the data transfer objects. Now, I didn't necessarily have to do this because I was uh, uh, kind of being lazy and reusing those entities. If instead I'd had a separate module for my uh, data for the rest stuff, I could have made that immutable to start with and I wouldn't need to have this translation to DTO. I could have just returned that immutable data or just use the DTOs directly. <clears throat> okay, so then the rest of these guys, this is a helper function. I probably shouldn't have written it this way because it's, it's just, um, it's a little more terse, but it, it's, it's not as obvious. I, I set up a, a, a function here that's just kind of a, a skeleton function to say how I want to actually handle responses. So I'm passing in just a type name, like actor, movie, or uh, a rating. I'm passing in the ID of what I want to look up. I'm passing in a function to say how to convert the entity type to a, a data transfer object, and a function to go and get the value from uh, the service. 
So what I'm going to do is go get the value. If the response is, is not successful, I'm going to throw an exception here, and then the caller has to deal with the exception. Otherwise, I'm going to say if the body is non-null, convert it to a DTO. If the body is null, I'm going to throw this exception. So I just wanted to have that same logic repeated, and I could have just repeated it in these other functions. So um, I just wanted to make sure it was consistent. So down inside here, I have this get with roles, get movie with roles, get rating with roles that just call that helper function. And so it says, I'm going to you know, try to get the actor with this ID, and here's the getter and the 2DTO. OK, so that's all those guys are doing. The updates, actually, oh yeah, this one is doing it with context. I just wanted to make sure that I'm going to the, um, to the, the, the IO dispatcher. So then for the updates, I'm going to switch to the IO dispatcher, make the call, and then I'm going to refetch the data. So that refetch is going to emit data into the flow. So we'll see up in here that fetch, it says flow value, it's fetch or take if yada yada. Flow value, if you're using a mutable state flow, is the same type of thing as emitting to it. OK, and then reset database. We're just going to go off and reset the database. And then I'm going to force these guys to fetch. Whoops. Let's do the ratings as well. Otherwise, we're going to miss that. Um, oh, well, this is not good. Take a look at what I did here. I said delete movies by ID, and I am delete movie. The flow manager here is movies flow manager. This one here, I didn't update the right one. So it should be actor flow manager. And this one should be ratings flow manager. OK, that should be better now. So finally, what we need to do is choose which repository we want to actually talk with. So if we go back to our app layer and take a look at our view model. So our view model right now is creating an instance of movie database repository. So what I'm going to do is just change that to be movie rest repository. And he doesn't use an application. He needs the view model scope. He needs a coroutine scope to run things in. And I think we should be in good shape there. Let's see what happens when we run it. Let's see. So the server, is it running? Server's running. Let's go ahead and run the emulator. And we should see a crash. Try running it again. Boom, crash. So let's take a look at Logcat and see if we can figure out what's going on. Um, so there we go, the Pixel 4. I'm going to clear that, and let's try running it. OK, so there's a couple problems we have here. One is clear text communication to 10.0.2.2, not permitted by network security policy. So by default, you have to be doing things using SSL in Android. I don't want to go down that path right now. SSL in Android works the same way as SSL in Java. It's something you can look up. For now, I'm going to disable that. I'm going to explicitly say that we can use uh, clear text communication. Really bad idea in a normal application, but I just don't want to go down the rabbit hole of SSL. So let's go to our manifest in the application. And in our application tag here, I'm going to have uses clear text traffic equals true. And that gets us around that. Please, please, please don't use this in real applications, especially if you have any type of sensitive data. So now here's our second crash. Let's go back to our log cat. Let's see. 
if they actually have a message for it. Uh, sometimes it's a little hard to find the errors. Hmm. Because the problem here should be that we don't have internet permissions specified. And I'm just trying to see if there is a message here that will let you know that that's the problem. Let me try that again. Hmm. It's not showing it. What we need to have in here is a user's permission for internet. Just to say that we're this app is requesting to actually have network access. That should make it work. I'm rather disappointed that there wasn't a clear error message on it. Yep, there it's working. Um, I'll have to see if I can look through the logs a little bit more closely and see if there's something that hints at that. Uh, if you ever wanna use any type of network connection, you have to specify this. Now, internet permission is not considered a dangerous permission. What that means, a dangerous permission is one that is going to potentially expose user personally identifiable information. So something like the camera, something like the recorder for the voice recorder, um, it's things that are uh, you know, looking at contact information, um, anything that can that can potentially be used to identify a user or location information is another one. Anything that could be used to, to potentially identify a user or you know is sensitive data for that user is going to be marked as a dangerous permission. And when we talk about permissions later, uh, we're going to see that dangerous permissions need to be handled at runtime. So your code has to actually pop up a message for the user saying hey, I'm requesting these permissions, is that cool? And if the user says no, you won't be able to use that functionality. And uh, in some cases that makes your app useless. In other cases, you wanna to try to set it up so that certain features are just disabled if the user says they don't wanna do it. Um, if an app, if a permission is not a dangerous permission, you know, inter just you know, generally just talking to the internet is not considered a dangerous permission, um, then you don't have to have runtime permissions, but, you need to specify it in the manifest. So now that I have it, things are running and let's take a look at what this looks like. So we have our all our uh, guys there. If I click on a movie, there we go. Click on Jason Statham, Transporter 2, Amber Valletta. Let's go back here. So Transporter 2, Jason Statham, Transporter, ta-da. So it looks like that's working okay. Now, just so we're really sure that this is running the right stuff, Let's actually tweak some stuff on the server and see, or actually tweak it here and then just dump the server and see what happens. So if I change the transporter to be the transporter QWERTY, something like that. Let's go take a look at that server now. Um, oh, did I close? I closed my browser. I'm going to go ahead and take a look at the movies there. And we'll see now the transporter QWERTY is showing up there. So. We've now successfully communicated with this server to do our updates. And that's kind of cool. Uh, and if we ended up changing the data directly in here, uh, let's see, do I have advanced REST client installed? Um, I doesn't look like I do yet. Let's see if I can install that. And let's do a post, actually a put, I wanna do an update. And I'm going to copy the data for one of these guys, let's say for transporter two. 
I'm going to go ahead and copy his data and come over here. Oh, where'd the app go? Oh, there he is. And I'm going to set up the body to be this. And let's say it's transporter to XYZ. And we're going to put this to localhost colon 8080 slash movie slash M2, send the data. And we got an error there somehow. Invalid response, protocol error. Oh, it probably HTTPS. Unsupported media type, that's interesting. So uh, apparently I'm not set, I didn't have it set up to consume that. No, that actually has to be working. Uh, oh, uh, body content type, JSON. Let's try that now. There we go. So now he's actually updated. If I come over here and refresh, I see the XYZ. If I come over to my application, let's back out. I'm going to switch over to the actors page, then back to the movies page. That did not refresh the data. How can I force it to refresh the data? Um, I think if I edit anything else, it should refresh the data. There we go. So now we see the transport to XYZ. So he's seeing that. So this, this, um, if we have something like an application like this that you want to know the data on the server has changed, you're going to have to set up some kind of feedback mechanism from the server. Um, typically, you could use something like cloud messaging, where you're going to register with a server that will communicate to your phone, basically pinging it to say, hey, some data has changed. And then you can go and refresh that explicitly. Um, or we can add a refresh button. Um, or maybe you have a certain cache amount of time. So after a certain amount of time, you automatically refresh, assuming data is stale. There's any number of ways you can do this, but we'll see that we actually did see the data there. Um, maybe we explicitly, when you switch these pages, refresh the data for that page instead of having it stored in the view model like we're doing. Um, so there's a bunch of different approaches we can do on something like that. Any questions? So assignment-wise, you're not going to have a new assignment this week because you're still working on an assignment. Um, but the next assignment, just to kind of give you a little heads up, where's my browser? Let's go to, I haven't posted it on Canvas yet, and I may tweak it slightly, but uh, I'm going to show you the previous version of it real quick. Uh, this assignment is actually going to take into account Google Maps, uh, REST, and then I may get rid of the services part of this. Um, Android services are there for you to, uh, the, the main reason I like them is you can have one application expose its data through a service so you can control how your data is accessed. Uh, that can be really, really useful if you have uh, some kind of data source that other people might want to try to consume. Um, or if you're providing you know, some support on the platform for some custom hardware. Maybe you set up a service that does all the, the nasty binary stuff to get a hold of the custom hardware, but exposes it through an Android service for other applications to use. Um, you can also use it to, to run some work in the background, uh, but it, it's not used as much for that anymore, especially because some of the OEMs are kind of blindly killing processes. Um, you know, there, there's uh, some OEMs out there, they're trying to, to spruce up their benchmarks by randomly killing anything that's not actively running. And uh, it's actually killing services that were supposed to be running in the background. And so it's been causing a lot of problem. So I might kill that from the assignment. I haven't decided yet. Um, but what you're going to do is you're going to be setting it up so that you have a Google map that's going to display the Washington, D.C. area. And you're going to talk to a server that I have. And it's actually just some static files on a web server. Um, but you're going to kind of treat it like rest calls to find the positions of the UFOs. 
and you're going to draw lines between the last known position and the current known position of the UFOs. So it spells out a secret message. Um, and uh, you're going to be using REST to communicate with the server. You're going to be using Google Maps here. And normally, I have the, uh, uh, the actual REST stuff in a service. Uh, but I haven't decided firmly if I want to do that or not. If I do, next week, we'll talk about both Maps and services. Well, I may talk about both of them anyway, but um, otherwise, you know, we'll only be focusing on the maps part for the assignment, uh, which will simplify things a little bit. Um, I kind of want to do a services assignment, but I got to think about that some more. Um, okay, but that's what the next assignment's going to be. So we've talked about the, the REST communication. You're going to be using that behind the scenes here. So when we're inside of here, you're really just going to be focusing on setting up something like this um, API service to go and fetch data from the server uh, and then make your call to actually fetch it. So that'll be fairly simple for that part of it. Um, the service side of it makes it a little bit more complex and uh, the maps makes it a little more interesting. So the structure we're having here, we're not going to be fetching data like this and displaying data and editing data. You're just going to be fetching data you know, once every second. You're going to be making a, a call up to the server. OK, any questions on anything? OK, well, that's really all I wanted to cover today. Um, if I had, I, it, it would have gone a little longer if I'd actually typed everything in. Um, but uh, we'll call it a day. And if you have any questions, give me a yell uh, or post on the forums. And uh, otherwise, I will see you all next week. Good night.